Today I've got Emma Wall with me. She and I did a message together about a year ago. I think that's right, yeah. About a year ago, and she was raising support to go into a, to join a ministry that does an outreach ministry in England. And so she has spent a year there, and we'd like to get an update. So Emma, we're glad you're with us again. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. It's Good. kind of so, surreal. <laughs> so tell everybody, what's the name of the ministry you've been a part of for the last year, and what kind of things do you do? Um, so the ministry is called Canvas, um, and we are we try to be a place for university or for college students. So we have a house, and we do different events throughout the week. But we're also open throughout the week for students to come, and then we as staff like to go meet them out around the city as well. Okay, so at this house, you'll have meals for them, or coffee, or how does that work? We do. We have certain meals that we do for events. I also like have one day a week where I like to bake things, and like students come. Um, we also have a really massive board game shelf. We have some very enthusiastic board gamers. And then like tea and coffee throughout the week, so whenever students want some. Church played a big part in your life growing up. That, was, that isn't the case for a lot of these people, right? Yes, definitely. A lot of our students who come to Canvas are students who would probably never choose to walk into a church on their own. Some of our students, they maybe went to like a Catholic school, so like they maybe had to learn about God and he was just this guy who had a bunch of rules and stuff in some of their lessons. And then other students, it's things like we have one student and all she knows of Jesus is what like, she's seen on television. Like she's seen Christians on a TV show and like that's all she has. And so that's not an uncommon story for a lot of our students. How do we pray for you, Emma? I think one thing I definitely am like asking for personally is just boldness and having these de deeper conversations of faith and life. Um, I think there is wisdom and discernment in knowing when to have them. Like you don't want to go up to someone you've just met and um, been like, Jesus, am I right? Like that's gonna, that won't go over well. But also I think I can get caught up in the fear of like, oh, it's not, not yet, not yet, not yet. I need one more coffee with this person or I need to just like talk about a TV show one more time and then, then I'm in. Um, and I think not letting fear take control and just like being brave and just having those conversations and seeing how they go. And if they're uncomfortable sometimes, that's okay. And just embracing it. Okay, Emma, you stepped out, I mean, and said, hey, I'm gonna raise support for this. That took you like a couple of years because it was all during COVID. And, yeah. they, and you couldn't go when you originally even planned to. Yeah. So all your plans got changed. Do you still feel like it was the right thing to go to the place you've been the last year? Oh, definitely. I The journey to get here was a weird one because it wasn't <laughs> even, like I was originally going to Ireland with a whole different team. That's what I was gonna say. If I yeah. remember right, you weren't even planning to go to England. Yeah, it was like different location, different timeline. And I think there was a lot of like, sadness along that journey and like, oh, this isn't what I thought it was gonna be. But I think once I got there, it's been confirmed, like this is where I was supposed to be. And I'm so, so grateful that it's the time and like the place that I ended up. If you'd like to find out more, if you'd like to, if you'd like to talk to Emma, if you'd like to find out how you can contact her, support her ministry, how you can pray for her, you're gonna be out in the lobby after the worship service, right? Yes. So she's gonna be out in the lobby. She'd love to meet you. Y'all in for a real treat this morning. Dr. John Ed Matheson is here and he'll be speaking to you. He was my senior pastor for almost 20 years at Fraser Methodist in Montgomery. And uh, Debbie and I are out of town this morning. We're at the baptism of one of our grandsons in Atlanta and we'll be back next week. But um, I wanna tell you, John Ed taught me so much about ministry, it's unbelievable. And he gave me opportunities to discover and try out uh, ministry uh, in so many ways. I can't thank him enough. I'll forever be grateful for him. And I'm glad you get to hear from him now. Great, and I want to thank you for the privilege of being here. What a joy. What a, th this building is unbelievable. And your location, your staff, and can I predict this is going to be the greatest week of ministry you've ever had. <laughs> because John Schmidt and Shane Seegers are both out of town. So... <laughs> And you got a great staff in charge right here. Welcome to the newest Wu Pig Suey. Well, welcome to this. Thanks for being a part of that. I, I love what you're doing. Now, uh, they always kidded me. They said, you need to learn to preach from an iPad. So I want you to tell John and Shane, that's what I did this morning. Now, I'm not sure how you cut it on, so I'm just going <laughs> to leave it, leave it right there. Um, uh, if you'll, you got an outline in your bulletin, if you'll take it and look at it, 
It's very helpful because you can follow it and see about how long it'll be before I get through. John told me, he said, I only preach about 18 minutes. Is that true? He said, I'm going to give you 25 to do it there. So I'm going to be less at that. But you can take this outline and follow it. And you can see about how long it'll be before I'm through. Now, in retirement, I went into a leadership ministry. In the last few years, it shifted a lot to a digital ministry. If you look on the back of that outline, you'll see some opportunities. Every day, I do a short podcast, 58 seconds, multiple radio stations, and we place it on social media, if you'd like to just hear that briefly. I do a good news video every morning at 10 o'clock. Every week I do a blog that's carried by several newspapers and we mail out several thousand of them if you'd like to receive it. It tells you how to do it. Now, the reason we put all this on here is if you're over about 40, you wouldn't know how to access it. And if you don't have a grandchild at home, this will help you do it right here so you can get to that. Uh, also, I do a video every week, I got a minute. Also, in retirement, decided I ought to write a book every year. And I've been doing that for 15 years, and I love the last one I just did. I love sports. John Schmidt didn't care anything about sports, but I loved sports. And uh, this is Life Lessons Learned from Sports, about 54 lessons. And I had a coach this week call me and say, hey, I want to get 60 of those for every player on my team and every coach and how to school this I mean, a city said, look, can we get a whole box of those books and we want to give them to every coach. It's great little lessons. There's some of those available out in the foyer area. But thank you so much for letting me be here. Can we pray? Father, to stand here where John, Shane, Steve, so many people, this marvelous music, thank you. Now I pray that you would hide me behind the cross and not hear my voice, but your voice as you would speak to us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I love your new building. You've just moved out here. John just asked me, would you just share some of the things that as a congregation, when you move to a new building, what do you need to be thinking about? And as you move forward into the future, what kind of direction should we have? And I began to think about that. So today I'd like to just talk about a new building and a new future. Now, you've got a great opportunity here. The layout, my, my wife, Lynn, would you stand up? I'm glad to have her here. She's the best part of our family. And she is, uh, she was just commenting how well everything is done in this building. But let me tell you, a building doesn't make a church. A building will give you an opportunity. But... There's other things involved besides just the building. So I want to look at two things specifically here. I want to look at what is not new. Now, the building is new. The future is new. But there are some things that are not new. Let me walk through them real quickly. What is not new? Number one, the leader of this church is not new. It's Jesus. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One thing that churches do sometimes when you move into a new building or you experience growth is we tend to start doing things that didn't bring us to where we are today. And today there's so much, churches are declining. There's so much discussion today about Jesus and well, was he really divine? Did Jesus really do miracles? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? I want to remind you that Jesus Christ is the same today and tomorrow and forever. And the task of the church is to lift Jesus up. He said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people unto me. Uh, one day, a preacher was had the children up front, and he was giving them a logic lesson. And he said, I I'm thinking about something. It's a little four-legged, furry animal that runs and collects nuts and can climb trees. What am I thinking about? And one little boy said, Jesus. Preacher said, how'd you come up with Jesus? He said, preach, it sounds like a squirrel to me, but I didn't figure you called us down here to talk about squirrels. <laughs> Can I say to you that too many churches start talking about squirrels and other things and forget about Jesus? Go back. I wish I had time this morning just to 
the foundation of our country. This country was based by forefathers who believed that Jesus was the answer to everything. The very first Chief Justice, John Jay, said if we're a Christian nation, we ought to try to elect all Christian leaders at every level. Wow, is that true today? George Washington said it would be impossible to govern ourselves or to govern others without the Bible and without God. Now, friends, we live in a day and age where we've shifted away from that. But I want to say one thing that doesn't change is you're out here. Always ask yourself the question, are we lifting up Jesus? He's what it's all about. The second thing I want you to notice it's not new is the message. Sometimes we dilute the message. Sometimes we think the message changes. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that who should believe in him should have eternal life. Now, there are a lot of folks saying today, well, there are other ways to God, not just through Jesus. There are other things. One thing that's really plaguing our society today is the idea that we can achieve something about our salvation. And we can never achieve it. All we can do is receive what God has given to us in the gift of his son. And that message is for everybody. We don't preach survival of the fit. We preach revival of the unfit. And I am a sinner saved by grace. And if God can save me, he can save anybody. And as you look out across the river region, there are thousands of people who need to know Jesus. Now, there are folks who tell, oh, there are other ways. Listen, <clears throat> the answer to every problem we have today is Jesus and his message. And when he transforms people, everything is different. We can have a great military. I love the military. Fraser was inundated with military people. I love the military and do a lot of the prayer breakfasts at, breakfast at some of their bases. What can I say to you? The Bible says, and unless the Lord guards the city, those who guard it do so in vain. And the answer ultimately is not in the military. It's not in the economy. Ultimately, it's not in education. Ultimately, the answer to everything is in Jesus and his simple message. So can I say to you, always keep that forefront. <clears throat> this week, I was in the, doing some recording, and a guy walked by me and tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around, and it was Tyrone Peterson. When Tyrone was a kid, he didn't have any parents, and he was a problem kid. He was in multiple, multiple foster homes and institutions, and when he was about the eighth grade, he was at the Brantwood Children's Home. And the church I served gave a scholarship to him to go to a Fellowship of Christian Athletes conference. And guess what? He got saved. And when Tyrone got saved, everything changed. I mean, the man at, at Brentwood called me and said, John Ed, come out here. Tyrone, every morning, he makes every kid in this institution get up and come down to the dining hall at 6 o'clock and hear your devotion, and then he prays with all of them. And let me tell you, he changed. I love to walk down the walk mall with him. Every kid in town knew him, and he's a coach today. He'll tell you the only difference in his life is the fact that Jesus saved him and gave him a mission. And that's the third thing that's not new. It's the mission. I want to remind you, when you move out here to a new building, a new location, the mission's still the same. Now, now hear me very carefully. Uh, let me tell you what's so easy to happen. As you begin to grow and as things start to happen, you start getting involved in things that are good, but they're not the best. And many churches level out because they're doing good things, but not the thing that they're really called to do. The mission of the church is to bring people to Jesus Christ. Go and make disciples. The big question is, who's being saved lately? If folks aren't being saved, we don't need to be a church. You can be some other kind of club. So, so just briefly, these things are not new. The leader that we have. And can I say that Jesus is the leader? And you've got a great physical leader in John Schmidt. I don't know of a more talented and gifted person, and I loved working with him. And then this staff you've got, it's unbelievable, your leaders.
But then most important is that message. Always stay centered on the fact that Jesus can change anybody, anytime, anywhere. And also keep asking yourself the question. You got values listed here. You got the mission. Follow me a minute. It's easy to have a mission in print, but not in practice. And when you put something in print, be sure that you practice it all the way. Who's being saved? Now let me shift gears a minute. What must change? This is a new building. This is a new location. I want to suggest to you that you've got a new future in what God wants to do. It, 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 you're going to have to change some things. It's easy to become complacent. You're going to do some things differently. In every church, there are three kinds of folks. There are risk takers, there are caretakers, and there are undertakers. Risk takers are not afraid to step out and to do something. Let me just challenge you as a church. Be open to God, and he's going to call you all to do things that other folks will say, that's foolish. I'm not sure we can do it. Let me say first, one thing is your vision. You always got to have a vision. What's out there? I know you got it written down, but what really is the vision that the people are going to walk by here at Center Point Fellowship? It, it's vision. Unless you see it before you see it, you'll never see it. Let me say that again, vision. Unless you see it before you see it, you'll never see it. And I hope if you're a leader in this church, in a small group, wherever you're a leader, what's your vision? About seven or eight years ago, a couple of guys came to me and said, we got a vision. And they started sharing it with me. And my first reaction was, y'all will never do that. But I didn't tell them that. God was in it. And these two guys had a passion for a school that would serve inner city boys, about 70% of whom by the seventh grade would either be in jail or dead. And boy, they had a vision and Valiant Cross Academy was established. And everybody said, you can't do it. But listen, when God gives a vision, the word can't isn't in God's vocabulary. And these guys started a school and they had 30 boys. And every, week, every year they've had 30 more. I went to the graduation about a month ago. First graduation, 30 boys started. Instead of having 70% of them drop out, guess how many they graduated? 29 out of 30. And one young boy had been killed by a stray bullet. And they gave him a diploma to his parents. And that's a marvelous thing. I have the privilege to serve on that board. Uh, Bill Bright was one of my great heroes. I had an opportunity. He invited me to be a part of a group who wanted to get this. This was his vision, a huge vision. Now, don't let your vision become limited. It's easy to say, well, let's sort of keep the vision where we think we can do it. If your vision is what you can do, it's not a vision. It's only a vision when you're going to do something that only God can do it. Bill Bright said, we want to start five million churches. Did you get that? Say five million. That's a lot. And we're going to win one billion, say one billion, people to Christ by 2020. You know what folks said? That's crazy. You know what Dr. Bright said? It's my vision. And boy, around the world... People went to work, and guess what? The vision became reality. I just want to tell you, God can do anything. Don't undersell the vision that God's going to give you as a church. Uh, Dr. John Haggai is a great mission person. Uh, he, I had a chance to visit with him. He, he just does huge things. He made this statement. He said, attempt something so great for God that if God isn't in it, it's doomed to fail. A lot of churches have visions that are just words. A lot of people have goals that are just words. It's your vision. Be sure you tweak it. Be sure it's what God wants. Another thing is just your opportunities. Opportunities. Out here in a new location, you're going to have new opportunities. I, I, I applaud you for several years setting up every morning on Sunday morning for worship, 
and taking down all that stuff. And, you know, some churches do that for three or four months. Y'all did it for several years. You had a vision, and now God's given you an opportunity. I'd like to suggest to you, all that time y'all spent setting up and tearing down, use that time to win somebody to Jesus. Because it's a new opportunity, and it's a new great thing that you can do. Um, some of us don't like opportunities. Can I say to you that an opportunity is never wasted? If God gives you an opportunity and you don't take it, somebody else will. And God gives us an opportunity. When the door opens, walk through it. And let me say as a church, doors don't stay open long. They close or other people walk through them. You got to change. That, that's tough for us to do. If you like football, uh, I, I'm glad you're going to come over and see Alabama and Auburn, some real football from out there in Arkansas. <laughs> You'll see one team not too far from here in Tuscaloosa who just a few years ago, their coach was the most vocal against the fast-paced offense and said he should never do it and tried to block it. And he couldn't. So what did he do? He adapted. And he started running a fast-paced offense. And last year was in the top three in offense. There was another guy named Les Miles who'd won a national championship, but he didn't like that fast. He wasn't doing that. And he doesn't have a job today. <laughs> Let me suggest to you that times are changing and if we're not willing to be open to where God's leading us to a change, uh, Auburn basketball never had been a whole lot. In fact, they cut down the size of the arena because folks didn't come. And they got a guy in there named Bruce Pearl. And he started a whole new idea that most folks said you ought not to be doing. Three-point shooting, run, gun. And he did pretty good this past year. A lot of other teams didn't even make it anywhere. Can I say to you that we're living in a new day and a new age? Let me suggest a couple of things. Next week, we're going to talk about youth. You've got to reach youth. That's a key. The next week, you're going to be talking about children. And you've got to reach children. Now, you can't do it like you did it 10 years ago. You can't reach youth or children like you did in the past. How does God want you to reach them today? And you're willing to do that. Then you're going to talk about young adults. This whole area <clears throat> is loaded with young adults. Let me give you a startling statistic. It's just reported by Gallup that for the first time in history, less than 50% of the people in America said that religion was important to them. It used to be 80% said it's important. Today it's 49%. And on the heels of that, they had another survey. It was shocking because people who were asked, do you believe in God? Get this, in America, only 81% of the people said, we believe in God. That's down from about 95 just recently. But here's what was really shocking. Among young people, 18 to 29, only 68% believe in God. Friends, we in America have gone the wrong direction. And somebody's got to turn it around for children and youth and young adults and middle-aged adults and some of us older people. Keep asking yourself questions. How can we best minister in this situation? And what is God calling us to be? Opportunities. I love this passage in Romans 8. It says, the whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming into their own. Wow. The whole world's on tiptoe. Can I say to you, the river region's on tiptoe, watching to see what the sons of God here at Fellowship, at Cross Point Fellowship, what God's going to do in and through you. Don't be afraid to change. I must confess to you that I had to do that. I had to do it several times in the ministry. John and Shane were people that were always prodding me and said, we need to look at doing this. And then in the ministry I'm in now, for about 10 years, I went to 
several countries in the world, went to places training pastors. Then all of a sudden, about four or five years ago, I learned something about digital, that you can do something digitally, and instead of going to India six times, I can train pastors in India digitally, and I can have a message. And so my whole ministry has changed because some folks, including my wife, prodded me to say, you talk about change, why don't you do it? <laughs> so I'm trying to do it. And let me tell you what's happened. I've just given you some opportunities that you can follow some of these things. Right now, we have hired some folks that knew what they were doing that, that helped with this. Right now, we're reaching a little over 80,000 people a week through the digital ministry. Can I just say to you, it's unbelievable. Don't be afraid to jump into something that's different. I was reading about the African Impala. It's one of the greatest leapers. The African Impala can jump 10 feet high and jump for 30 feet. But do you know how they corral them and keep them? They don't put a chain or a, don't put any kind of a rope on them. They just put them down and they put a little fence that's five feet high. Now they can jump 10 feet high, 30 feet, but you put them behind a five foot fence and Adam Powell won't ever try to get out. You know why? He won't jump unless he can see where he's going to land. And he can't see over five feet. So he just stays there and he's captive. You know what's wrong with most churches today? Most people, we stay captive and we're scared to jump because we can't see where we're going to land. When God says, step out of the boat, the water's going to be as solid as the wood of the boat. And I just want to encourage you, the opportunities, they're new and how God's going to open those with every age group. And the last thing, let me just mention, the possibilities unbelievable what God can do. God's not limited. You see, some folks say, humanly speaking, you can't do that. It's impossible. Let me tell you what growing churches, let me tell you what effective churches do. They don't listen to what people say. They listen to what God says. And while man says some things are impossible, what does it say? With God, most, is that right? Most things, 90%, Pretty good. What does it say? Say that again. All things are possible. Do you believe that? Are you willing to embark a new location with a new future that God can do anything? That's unbelievable. A fellow was fishing one day and wasn't catching anything. Another guy over here was just pulling them in as fast as he could put his hook in the water. And, but he did a strange thing. Every time he caught a fish, he took out his foot-long ruler and he measured the fish. And if the fish was longer than the ruler, he threw him back. If it was shorter, he kept him. This guy was fascinated first because the guy was catching fish. Secondly, why is he throwing the big ones back? So he rolled over and he said, tell me, first, what kind of bait are you using? <laughs> then he said, why do you measure each one of them and then throw back the big ones? He says, very simple. He said, my frying pan is only 12 inches in <laughs> diameter. Man said, what you need to do is get a bigger frying pan. <laughs> Maybe if you don't remember anything else I've said today, how big is your frying pan? Personally, in terms of ministry, but most importantly, in terms of this church, how big is it? A new location a new future. Some things are not new. Don't mess them up. The leader, Jesus, his message and his mission, th those are not new. Be sure you stay locked into those. But there are some things that have got to change. Your vision, your opportunities, the way you do ministry, the possibilities of what God can do. I had an interesting occasion just a few years ago. I was invited to speak over at uh, an Assembly of God church in Montgomery on Vaughan Road, Wednesday night. And I went over and spoke, had a great time. As I started to leave, 
the pastor uh, said, here's an envelope. I said, what is it? He said, what's well, a little check for you? I said, check? I, I don't, it's only about a mile and a half from my house. I don't have any expenses. He said, yeah, but it'd be embarrassing to us if you didn't take it. Would you take it? I said, sure. So I put it in my Bible. The next morning I got ready to read my Bible. I took out the check. This is it right here. And I looked at it and it's made out to me. It's dated and it is signed, but they didn't put an amount in. So I called the bank and I knew the guy working there and I said, hey, uh, I need to let you know that uh, the account at Evangel Temple is overdrawn. He said, John, they're not overdrawn. They got more money than any church in town. I said, not for long. <laughs> and, and I told him, I told him, told him what had happened. And he said, uh, well, I, what should I, I said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Call the pastor right now and let me get on the phone and listen and tell him that they're overdrawn. <laughs> so he calls and the pastor answers and all he said, y y your account's overdrawn. He said, couldn't be. He calls the comptroller, the businessman. He comes in, he says, say that again. Your account's overdrawn. That couldn't be. He said, how could that be? He said, well, a Methodist preacher came in this morning with a check. And the amount he's writing for it is more than y'all have in that. And immediately he said, John Ed, what happened? I said, you didn't sign the check. He said, bring it back and we'll give you another one. I said, no way. <laughs> You're not getting this check back. And if my church gets in trouble, I know how we're going to get out of trouble just really quickly right there. I just want to say to you, center point, fellowship. God has signed a blank check and he's saying to you, fill it in. What are you going to fill in? Let's pray. I don't know what agenda you brought to this service of worship. I do know God can meet any need, every need. And right now, Father, may we be honest. If we don't know you personally, May we receive you as our Lord and Savior right now. May we just pray for forgiveness, for your forgiveness. And, oh, God, each of us needs to be looking at what, what, what am I going to do in this new location, this new building? May we be totally open. Oh, God, may we be responsive May we not have to see where we're going to land before we jump. May we just jump and risk and follow you. At this time of decision, Lord, convict us, convert us, and may we be committed to following you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.